Um, perfect. So yeah, as Rachel mentioned, I've been helping Diversion Strategies with some of their organics programs down in Southern California. So it's so great to be here today. Just wanna to start off with a polling question um, to kind of set the tone. So Rachel, if you wouldn't mind launching that now and we'll give you about 30 seconds. So what is the primary reason that you would participate in a city provided organics recycling collection program at home as if you were a resident? You can only select one. So this is the top motivating factor. With education and outreach, we're looking a lot about at motivating factors. And so this is a great question to kind of start us off as this is something we should be thinking about within our own communities. Great, Natalie, they're still rolling in. So I'm just gonna give it another 10 or 15 seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll now and we'll uh, we'll stick with what we've got. Thank you everyone for participating. We'll share it at the end. Okay. Great. So it sounds like we will look at those at the end, but I just wanted to get you to start thinking about what might motivate you and to keep in mind that what might motivate you to act a certain way in regards to sustainability behavior might not be the same for another person. So as we're creating education and outreach programs, we wanna be learning about what is specifically compelling our community to behave in a certain way. So without further ado, I have been given 10 quick minutes to go through and present Recreate Waste Collaborative solutions for implementing SB 1383. I'll provide a brief introduction a summary of the problems related to SB 1383 outreach, and then present our top three solutions for implementing behavior change. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Natalie Lessa. I have spent the greater part of a decade now rolling out education and outreach programs in the solid waste industry. Just a quick story, if I can, um, about my experience. So one of the first jobs that I had out of university was working for Alameda County as their green child care coordinator. So I would dress up here as Rocky the Recycling Raccoon and go and teach three-year-olds about proper source separation. I'll be honest, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to take an hour lesson plan and actually create real changes in behavior. But through storytelling, through interaction, and through really crafting fun activities, I was blown away to see that this age group of students actually learned how to separate their trash correctly. I became fascinated by this and wanted to really take these strategies and apply them to adults. So since then, I have become a solid waste consultant and I am now the co-owner of Recreate Waste Collaborative. We are a Southern California based firm that provides boots on the ground technical assistance and education and outreach specifically for meeting legislative requirements. So to start off, let's look at what the problem or problems are that lie ahead with SB 1383 regarding outreach programs. We know that cities need to provide organics collection to residential and commercial sectors. This will require deliberate planned messaging to customers to let them know about the program and to teach new behaviors or existing, uh, reinforce existing behaviors. I see a polling question popped up for me, but I'm just gonna go ahead and minimize that because I'm not sure what that one's for. Okay, so here are some of the main, our main challenges that we hear from working within the community. There are space constraints. People believe they don't have the space to add a new bin or aren't sure about right sizing. There are time and energy constraints. So people might not have the bandwidth to take on a new program or train employees and tenants, or monitor contamination as is required by the law. There are major information gaps when it comes to the community's overall awareness of proper source separation and also many misconceptions out there or perceived problems such as the material is going to be smelly or attract vectors and varmints. Another major misconception is that people think their diversion programs should be free. So these concerns are important to be aware of because we can craft our messaging to shift mindset when we directly target certain fears or apprehensions. Okay, then there's the C word, contamination. Contamination is a direct result of a lack of proper education and outreach. And we'll discuss how to address this in the following slides. And then of course there's COVID, which has presented a new set of challenges for education and outreach, but it is still possible and we're just shape, reshaping the way that we do education and outreach now. So all of this has left us with the question, how do we get people to change their behavior? Well, first and foremost, it's crucial to understand your community. 
So this table shows the behavioral relationship between a person's motivation and knowledge, and everyone's going to fall somewhere on this table. Understanding where a person or an organization falls will help you develop communication strategies and messages that are targeted and more likely to lead to changes in behavior. So for example, the person that is down here on the bottom left that lacks both motivation and knowledge will be the most challenging. Your message not only needs to include information about the program, but also needs to include a call to action that addresses their motivating values. On the opposite end, the person that has knowledge and is highly motivated, these people are your zero wasters, your green ambassadors, people that are your allies that you can leverage to expand the reach of your message. But most people fall within this middle spectrum of motivation and knowledge, and depending on where, your messages will be shaped a little bit different. So how do we know where someone lands on this table? Well, you can do surveys like the one that we started with um, prior to my presentation. You can, can conduct polls. Or a great way to do this is by when you're actually out in the community engaging in conversation to learn where people fall and then use that as part of your communication strategy. Once you have this baseline understanding, it's then time to create your program. So solution number one is to develop a comprehensive multimedia approach. It is not just about signage. It's not just about a mailer or website updates. It is all of these things. So we need to incorporate different forms of medium in the outreach approach because there are different learning styles, different preferences in receiving information, and people need repetition. People need repetition because we're talking about needing to actually teach people and create real shifts in behavior that are sustained in the long run. And that doesn't happen in a one touch and go type of program. You need repetition and clear messages that are visually appealing so that you can also provide the community with opportunities to engage in dialogue via a two-way communication channel like social media or emails. This graph here shows how sales companies are spending their marketing money. It might be obvious to see that they are emphasizing web and digital, but it's also interesting to note that they are still spending money on all of the other different medium forms as well. There is no one size fits all approach to effective outreach. So how do we know which one of these mediums to engage? Ask the community. I was recently conducting stakeholder engagement at neighborhood association group meetings and posed this question in every meeting that was, as a resident, how would you like to receive your information? What are you paying attention to? And we were really surprised to actually hear that so many residents wanted to see paper advertisements. So each community is very unique. When you can poll them, um, ask the questions, and then plan to incorporate different mediums into your approach. Next, provide technical assistance and on the ground outreach. Community-based social marketing research shows that the major influence on our attitudes and behaviors is our contact with other people and people that we trust at that. Yes, these programs tra traditionally cost more than sending out a mailer, but the return on investment makes it worth it. What you're able to accomplish in person far exceeds that that you're able to do with other mediums, which are really better intended for disseminating information. But again, we're talking about behavior change, teaching a lifestyle, and gaining support for a program. So why conduct technical assistance and on-the-ground outreach? Well, doing so allows us to answer questions, to look at potential infrastructure issues and make necessary changes, to follow up with supplementary information or trainings, monitor the success of programs, we're teaching, we're instructing. And another often overlooked benefit is that when we are in person, we get to learn about the unique ins and outs of what those staff or residents are encountering. And that knowledge is power. It helps us to create better programs that address the real concerns and issues within that community. What else does on the ground outreach help with? relationship building. So working with these different groups means meeting with them regularly, again, repetition, and providing a high level of professional service. It's about having the right staff with people skills that are friendly, passionate, and genuinely want to help. That energy is felt by the customers, and it's truly hard to ignore. Strong relationships help with so many things. They generate hype. They provide an opportunity for organization members to contribute to the program development, and it allows us to disseminate information and teach um, person to person. So strong relationships help us um, in so many ways. Research shows that once a small group of people have adopted a sustainable behavior, that actually personal conversations are what are playing a pivotal role in that behavior being adopted more broadly, more so than media. The fact is that people trust information from people that they know. So the more people you can get um, to become familiar with 
the leaders of your program and to develop positive relationships with them, the more likely they are to want to participate and tell others what they're learning. And this is where influencing can happen on a grander scale. Your green ambassadors, your master composters, other engaged and motivated leaders in the community that others look up to and listen to. They can do the work for you and can expand the reach and success of your program. So talk about return on investment. So really quickly, I have just one final slide. These are some of the supporting tasks that will be necessary to implement a successful education and outreach program. Outreach doesn't just stop after you've done the work once. So measure progress with waste characterizations and site visits. Provide opportunities to receive feedback from the community and make any necessary changes or improvements to the program. Don't just keep repeating strategies that aren't working. Follow up with enforcement, oops tags, fees, other necessary measures for repeat offenders. Allocate funding for your education and outreach programs. The money is there. It might not have just been made a priority yet. And of course, all of this takes bold leadership. Program leaders that don't operate from a place of apathy, but rather believe that people do want to do the right thing. They just don't know how yet. And it is our job to show them. So with that, I would like to thank you so much for joining me for this portion of our series today. Again, my name is Natalie. My contact information is here. If you have any questions or would like to discuss more on how you might implement these solutions into your SB 1383 plan, I would be happy to talk more uh, so that together we can all waste less. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Natalie, for that. And um, I wanted to go ahead and just um, share the results of the poll. Uh, so 55% of our audience is, um, it, their primary reason is to reduce the global impact of climate change. So over half of us um, is that's the motivating factor um, with a, uh, a second place, a runner up of to keep, the hel uh, keep California air and soil healthy. Um, and then a, a good amount also uh, looking to comply with the, the state of California and local laws um, that, are that are required of them. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll share the rest of those polls um, afterward as well. So, okay.